Hello and welcome to this presentation related to energy methods considering both angular and linear motion. In this presentation we're just going to outline in detail one question related to the application of hoist. This is part three in this series of presentations. Part one was an introductory presentation outlining some basic applications of energy methods involving angular motion. Part two considered questions involving both angular and linear motion. And this part three presentation just considers a worked example related to hoist. It is assumed you've seen part one and part two before reviewing this presentation. An illustration of a drum hoist raising low W here vertically. Note the definition of a hoist is a device that's used to lift a load vertically whereas the definition of a winch is a device used to pull a load horizontally or over an incline. Sometimes the terms hoist and winch are used interchangeably but these devices are designed for different purposes. So the question we're going to now consider relates to a hoist because it's lifting a load vertically. Question 8. A winding drum of a hoist has a mass of 150 kilograms, an outside diameter of 600 millimeters, and a radius of gyration of 200 millimeters. A light cable is wound around the drum and carries a load of 97 kilograms. This load is accelerated from an initial speed of 1.5 meters per second through a distance of 5,000 millimeters. The final speed is double the initial speed. There is a frictional resistance to the linear motion of 0.15 kilonewtons and a frictional torque in the bearings of the drum it's equivalent to a couple of 5 newton meters. We're asked to determine firstly the work done T theta in raising the load to the specification stated above. Part B determine the input torque required denoted as capital T. And finally part C the maximum input power delivered by the driving motor. It says maximum input power there, so be careful. That's at maximum speed. The answers to part A, B and C of question 8 are shown in the bracket. I would encourage you to start the presentation and sketch this hoist configuration and extract appropriate information from the question. Be very careful with the units as stated in the question. Some will need conversions. I'll show you a diagram of the hoist arrangements on the following slide. Question 8 continued. On the right hand side I've shown a diagram of the hoist. Shows the load being raised. Shows the initial velocity u in the final velocity v. And the vertical distance travelled. Labelled as s here. Notice the datum used is at the bottom of the system. In other words when the load has velocity u. We would need it as a reference for calculating potential energies. Here's question 8. The solution. First of all, we're extracting the information from the question. So the outside diameter, capital D, stated in the question is 600 millimeters. And as always, we convert that into meters, 0.6 meters. So the radius of the drum, of course, is simply half the diameter, so 0.3 meters. The drum mass, denoted as m suffix d here, is 150 kilograms. As stated in the question. Radius of gyration k and the question is stated as 200 millimeters and again convert into meters 0.2 meters here. The mass of the load being raised by the hoist denoted as m suffix l here is 97 kilograms so that's the load that the drum carries. The distance traveled s of the load is 5,000 millimetres or 5 metres 
given in the question here. And then there are some frictional resistances. We have the linear frictional resistance. I've called that FF for friction force. That was 0 0.15 kilonewtons stated here. So removing the prefix, that's 150 newtons. And also the friction couple, denoted as T suffix F, the friction at the bearings of the winding drum, that's 5 newton meters. It's given directly in the question. There's some base information extracted from the question. Now part A wants us to find the work done. And don't forget work done in an angular sense is T theta, torque times angle turn through. So question eight, the solution continued. Let's now apply the principle of conservation of energy to this problem. As always, we'll consider the initial energy in the system at position one shown here, and any work input to the system between one and two, and that's equal to the final energy in the system, that's at position two here, and any work taken out of the system by frictional effects, for example. So if, as always, we consider our datum at the lowest point in our system when we're considering potential energies, so our datum here is at location 1. So let's think through the energies. Do we have any potential energy when the load, shown here, 97 kilograms, is at position 1? Well, the answer is no, because it's on the datum itself, on position 1. So I can ignore the first term here from our energy balance, it's not relevant to this particular problem. What about the kinetic energy at position one here? Well, we're informed that the load does have an initial velocity, u. So by definition, it will have linear kinetic energy. So that's the half m u squared term here. The mass is associated with the load, hence the suffix l here. Do we have any angular kinetic energy? Well, if the load has a linear velocity, then the winding drum must be raising the load, so therefore it must be rotating. So again, we have some kinetic energy, but now it's angular kinetic energy. That's the half I omega I squared term. Omega I being the initial angle of velocity of the drum, we will need to calculate. Is there any work into the system? Well, for the drum to rotate and to raise the load, then there must be some energy applied to it. So yes, there is work in. Indeed, it's what we have to find for part A of the solution. So I've got my W1 on the left-hand side. There is definitely work into the system here. So that's our unknown. Okay, that's all the energies for position one. Let's look at position two. When the load has now been raised a distance S vertically from position one. Well, now by definition, we'll have potential energy because the load is at this position here. If I show it sketched here. So yes, it will have potential energy. So we've got the MGH2, I've called it here, high at position two from our datum. Will there be any linear kinetic energy? Well, yes, we do, because we know the speed V at position two is twice that at position one. So we have the half ML V squared term. Do we have any angular kinetic energy? Yes, we do, because for the speed to have increased, then the angle of velocity of the drum must have increased. So again, we have the half I omega F squared here, the final angular velocity. Do we have any friction out of the system? Well, in this case, we do. We have two forms of friction out. We have the bearing friction at the drum, so that will be causing work out of the system because the friction will heat up the bearings and that will be dissipated into the atmosphere. So I have a TF theta, TF being the friction couple given in the question, and theta is the angle turned through by the winding drum, which we will need to find. We definitely have that work out of the system here. And also we're told in the question we have a frictional resistance. I called it FF on the previous slide. So that frictional force multiplied by the distance traveled, that's the frictional effects against linear motion. And that could be friction due to the cable in a pulley sheaf, etc. So that's how we work out of the system in this particular case. Question eight, solution continued here. Just repeated the energy balance above for reference, but I've ignored the first term on the left-hand side as there's no initial potential energy. So thinking of the information we need, do we have the mass of the load? We do, it's given in the question. Do we have the initial velocity of the load? Yes, that's given in the question. Do we have the moment of inertia? 
i, well it's basically we don't, but we can find the i from the mk squared term here, where m is the mass of the winding drum, which we are given, and k is the radius duration, which again we are given. So we will be able to find the i. Do we have the initial angle of velocity? Well, again, not explicitly, we have the linear velocity, but we have a relationship here between linear and angular velocity, so we can actually find the initial and indeed the final angular velocity for the winding drum. So yes, we'll be able to find that term. And of course, don't forget, in part A, we're trying to find the work into the system. That's what the question requires. On the right-hand side, again, we know the mass of the load. We always know gravitational acceleration. We know... The height, h2, is actually labelled as s on the previous slide. That's a vertical distance travel. We know that, so we can find that term. And again, we've got the mass of the load. We've got the final velocity of the load. It's double the initial velocity. We have the i. We can find the final angle of velocity. And as far as the work out the system through the friction effects, we have the frictional torque given in the question. We need to find the angle turn through. But again, we have an equation for that here. So that shouldn't be a problem. We have the dis linear distance traveled. We have the radius of the drum. So we'll be able to find the theta. And we have the frictional force and we have the linear distance traveled. Just notice in this particular case that H2 will be the same as the S term. They're the same term. The vertical height traveled H2 in the potential energy term is actually the same as the s value shown in the work out assist the linear friction term here so that's a question of determining the values we don't currently know from the appropriate equation and then solving the energy balance to find the work into the system in w1 so question eight solution continued so now we have to calculate the various angular velocities we need to now to solve the problem we know that the initial linear velocity is 1.5 meters per second that's given in the question we know the final linear velocity is twice the initial linear velocity so that's three meters per second given in the question so to find the initial drum angular velocity omega i have labeled it here that's simply the initial linear velocity divided by the radius of the drum so 1.5 meters per second divided by the radius, 0.3 meters. So that's five radians per second for the initial angle of velocity of the drum. And we can find the final angle of velocity of the drum, labeled as omega f here. That's simply going to be twice the initial angle of velocity. So that's 10 radians per second here. To calculate the moment of inertia of the drum i from the formula i is equal to the mass of the drum multiplied by the drum's radius of duration squared. We know the mass of the drum in the question, it's 150 kilograms, that was stated in the question. The radius of duration is 0 0.2 meters, given in the question, so 0 0.2 squared here. So any moment of inertia of the drum is 6 kilogram meters squared. To find the angle turn through by the winding drum, labeled that theta, from radian measure, we know that S is equal to R theta. S is the linear distance traveled, distance traveled by the load vertically. So rearranging, angle theta is S divided by the R, which is the radius of the drum again. So the height travelled is 5 metres, and the radius of the drum again is 0 0.3 metres. So 16 and 2 thirds radians is the angle turned to. Purely for reference here, I've put it in terms of revolutions. It's actually 2.6526 revolutions, but that's just for reference really. It's the theta value and radians we need in the calculation. So now we can return to our energy balance and solve for the work into the system. So question eight, solution continued. So here's the energy balance again, the initial energy and in the work into the system shown here is equal to the final energy plus the work out of the system shown here. And all that's happened on the next line is simply subtracted these two terms here from both sides of the equation. So that leaves me then with the work into the system as the subject on the left hand side. Our next line I've just factorized certain terms. This is my final linear kinetic energy. And this is my initial linear kinetic energy. So I just factorized here and brought those two terms together. And I've done the same with the next term. This is the final 
angular kinetic energy of the drum. This is the initial angular kinetic energy of the drum. So again, I factorized on those two terms here. I'll let you evaluate the solution here. You should find that the work into the system around 6,143.6 newton meters or 6.144 kilojoules. Question 8, the solution continued here. So in part B, we're asked to calculate the input torque, T. So if we know the work done, W1 in part A, that's equal to the torque applied to the winding drum here. We assume constant, theta. Simply so rearranging the equation for the torque, that's the work divided by angle theta. Inserting the values from the previous slide, this is the work done divided by the angle turns are in radians. So it evaluates to approximately 369 Newton meters. And finally, part C to calculate the maximum power, call it P max here, that relates to the maximum angular velocity. So P max is equal to the torque multiplied by the maximum angular velocity, omega F we calculated previously. So simply inserting the values for torque using 369 newton meters here and the final angle of velocity of the drum was 10 radians per second. So Pmax evaluates to approximately 3.69 kilowatts. And finally I'll leave you with a few tutorial questions extracted from my worksheet. This is question 9. I'll let you read the question at your own pace. But in this case we first of all have to find the distance travelled by the load that's being raised here in a given time. So that will be a Newton's equation of motion. Part B, we have to find the number of revolutions that's turned through by the winding drum in this case. Part C is the work done, the work input to the system. Part D is the input torque required, which you can find when we know the work done and the angle turns through. And finally, part E, the average power. Notice the hint there to use the average omega value. The answers are shown in the bracket. I'd encourage you to stop the presentation and attempt question 9. But you may find referring to this slide and literally ticking off information that you're given in the question. Apply the principle of conservation of energy. And I've shown the a full energy balance here related to question 8, just for reference really. And then decide what you need to find from the various equations we've been using. And finally, I've chosen question 11 from our worksheet. I'll let you read this at your own pace. And the answers are shown in the bracket here. Here's the bibliography used to help generate this presentation. And I hope this has been of interest to you. And thank you for viewing.